My name is Erica Christensen, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. This panel will explore how different professions interact with and understand death. Death is often a taboo subject that many are uncomfortable addressing. However, it is an unavoidable fact of life. Our panelists encounter death as part of their profession in different fashions, and it is our hope to discuss these differences and how they interact with the living. This discussion is part of the University Diversity Series and is sponsored by the student organizations FOUND and Archaic. At this point, I would like to turn the discussion over to our moderator, Dr. John Langdon. He is the University of Indianapolis Dean of College of Arts and Sciences and a professor of biology and anthropology. <laughs> Dr. Langdon teaches gross anatomy each year and oversees human biology graduate students interested in human evolution, anatomy, and biology. Again, I would like to thank you for all, all of you for attending today. Dr. Lincoln. Thank you, I appreciate the promotion that I think our Board of Trustees has something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were warned. We were warned that if Obamacare took effect, we would have death panels. <laughs> so welcome to the University of Indianapolis death panel. <laughs> Whether or not you've had a close experience with death in the first person or second person or a third person, you will because death is a fact of life. Some people have a hard time dealing with facts and more people struggle with this one than most. The guests around me this afternoon were invited because in their own ways, they all help people deal with death. So what kind of people deal with death on a professional basis? I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished panelists this afternoon. Um, starting on my right, uh, Dr. Greg Clapper is a professor of religion here at the University of Indianapolis. As an ordained minister and military chaplain, he, has, he counsels individuals who are facing the possibility of imminent death and their families uh, for, the, for those who have, have died. Um, Donna Haynes is a director of hospice nursing here in Indianapolis. Among other things, hospice nursing involves the care of terminally ill patients and working closely with individuals facing their own death or their families and how they cope with that um, impending event. Susan Clement is a psychologist practicing in Lapeer, Michigan. She participates in a suicide prevention line and also helps to counsel families who have lost members. Um, Dr. Eric Bartolink is a forensic anthropologist at the University of California, Chico. And his work in recovering and identifying victims has taken him as far away as Bosnia to the World Trade Center disaster. Um, he's also a bioarchaeologist, which means he sometimes has dealt with very, very old dead people. And Dr. Allison O'Daniel, um, assistant professor of anthropology here at the university, is a medical anthropologist. Medical anthropology seeks to understand how different cultures experience and try to understand illness and death. And her work is, has involved uh, spending time with minority women suffering from HIV infection and who are dealing with the intricacies of our healthcare system as they wrestle with their own illness. So each of these professionals in their own way, coming from different backgrounds, um, psychology, ministry, uh, anthropology, encounter death in different ways and um, have their own unique stories to tell. So I'm going to invite each one of them to, to speak for a moment on a question um, and then invite them to respond to one another if they so choose. Um, and uh, maybe some follow-up questions and then I'll invite the audience to participate as well. So. All of you deal with death or the real possibility of death um, of others in your professional lives. How do you, uh, it's a complex question here, how do you personally understand it? Um, what is death? What does it mean to you? How do you cope with being around it or next to it? And how do you help others cope? And I know that because of your different backgrounds, you want to maybe approach those questions from very different angles. So, Dr. Clapper. Thank you, Dr. Langdon, and I appreciate the uh, invitation to be with you all and with this distinguished panel. 
Um, I have a couple of different kinds of uh, reflections. Uh, as John uh, referred uh, to my background, I'm both a professor and uh, uh, I've served uh, 24 years in the chaplaincy and three years in local church uh, parish. So we certainly had a number of uh, funerals and deaths there. I've also lost three family members, both mother and father, and my brother last year uh, all died in uh, quite different ways and times. But uh, to think about death, certainly uh, in the Christian biblical understanding, uh, the spirit, whether it's a ruach in the Old Testament in Hebrew or a pneuma in Greek in the, in the uh, new, it's uh, identified with breath. So I mean, in, in some basic way, I, I won't try to get into the medical side of it with these experts, but in some basic way, it's when you stop breathing, stop breathing in God's spirit. And uh, that leads to the question, of course, what is life? And uh, I won't try to spin out too much on that, but I will say this, that in the Christian tradition, it certainly does entail being embodied. Uh, that's why the resurrection of, of the body is uh, so important, not only the resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection that we all look forward to. So it's not just a disembodied soul that we think is important. Um, but I will say this, while it's in, life is embodied, our symbolic identities are just as important as our physical. And a couple of uh, incidents from my own experience as a chaplain, I, right after I joined the uh, National Guard, uh, I was out in Iowa and my, my uh, <clears throat> base was the scene of a major plane crash. It was United Flight 232, July 19th, 1989. And those of you who, I'm sure you're all uh, born after that, um, but uh, this is a professor giving you uh, uh, permission to look this up on Wikipedia. You can look up uh, uh, United Flight 232, there's an article there. And I was on the scene about 15 minutes after the crash. And so uh, as a chaplain to that unit, and, and my unit was very involved in recovering the remains and, and uh, everything else from the crash, there's a couple of different memories that, that I want to share with you uh, on this topic. Um, a couple of different people who were out in the field recovering um, bodies and body parts, and everything had to be exquisitely uh, recorded by, uh, because of the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, and FAA. They were mandating everything be carefully chronicled. <clears throat> but several of my unit members afterwards came up to me and said, Chaplain, there must be something wrong with me. And I said, why is that? And they said, well, I get more broken up when I pick up a cowboy hat or somebody's driver's license or a birthday card than when I pick up a shin bone. So what's wrong with me? And there were several people that came up to me with a similar kind of reaction. And I think, you know, obviously I told them I don't think there's anything wrong with them. I think what that conveys is the importance of our symbolic identities. And, uh, you know, how you look in your, in your goofy driver's license picture or the kind of personal message somebody sends you in a birthday card. That says a lot more that you can identify with, you know, compared to that, Disattached, disattached leg is just a piece of meat. So that's, of course, a big part of my uh, interaction with the whole realm of death, uh, uh, symbolic uh, uh, identity. Um, because part of mourning, and one of my professors once said, mourning is probably the most profound thing that humans do. And I think he's probably right. Um, because you have to now go through the rest of your life and all these relationships without that one peace that has been there. So now you have to see everything in new, in new ways. Um, but uh, one of the uh, incidents from that plane crash, again, we had uh, many uh, um, 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 coroners, uh, people from the uh, FAA, um, state coroners, uh, medical examiners, and uh, we, they set up the mass uh, autopsy room in one of our hangars. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, one of our unit dentists was involved with identifying the uh, remains. That was the only way you could 
figure out who some of these burned up bodies were. And he told me a story about himself. Um, he said, when he finished identifying the last body, and they started off just being put in body bags with numbers on them, uh, but when he identified that last uh, body, somebody came along with a checklist and said, oh, okay, it's number 99, huh? And he got mad. And he told me the story later. He said, that's not 99, that's Mrs. Smith. I gave her identity back. You call her by the right name. And uh, I think that that conveys a bit of uh, how our uh, symbolic identity is tied up with the physical, separable from, and I won't take a lot more time, but I'll just say um, uh, one of the jobs of chaplains in the military, well, we have three descriptions in a, in a mass casualty situation. We have, uh, we're supposed to take care uh, of the uh, wounded, honor the dead, and care for the caregivers. And so that was one of the big uh, points of my focus uh, after the plane crash. You know, the dead are dead, you wanna honor them, but the people that are working with the bodies, you need to help them uh, deal with this. And so to all the future forensic people out there, I would just say, um, you're a scientist, you have great skills and knowledge, but you're also a human being. And so if you feel the need to talk about what you've experienced, don't think that you're strange. Think that you're human. And find someone to do it. It doesn't have to be a minister, maybe it's your boyfriend or girlfriend or sp uh, you know, s spouse. But it helps to process this, these things verbally because we are symbolic creatures. You know, some of the people wanted to just walk away after they worked in the morgue for two weeks and go out and get drunk. Um, but the people who survived well uh, into the future um, talked about it. So that's a simple recommendation for me. More to be said, but uh, I'll turn it over. Turning it over, wow, he's, that's fascinating what he's talking about. My situation is totally different, totally different. Um, I am a nurse by background and I've worked a lot in hospice about 25 years and what I worked with was people that were dying from things that were chronic illnesses like congestive heart failure, uh, chronic illnesses like COPD, uh, lung illnesses, neurological illnesses like Lou Gehrig's disease, and of course the big C cancer patients too, <coughs> in all ages. Um, but it's, it was more, it's more a natural part of life and death is very normal. But our society is a society that's death denying and it's a society that wants to push death into a corner and not talk about it. You know, back in the early 1900s, everyone died at home, or majority of people died at home, and so everyone around them saw death. I would guess that many of you have never watched a person actually die. You're too young to have done that because most of the time people die now in nursing homes and in hospitals. And maybe some of you have not even ever gone to a viewing before or a funeral before because we tend to try to push that away. I've even heard of drive up funeral homes where you can sign a register like at McDonald's when you drive through or you can do it on the internet now. And so you don't have a lot of experience with death other than uh, what you see on TV. And I can tell you that the deaths that I've personally been with have not been like what's on TV at all. It's a very natural part of watching someone slowly take their last breaths. Um, it's a mystery kind of thing to me, just like birth is a mystery. And with birth, we take nine months to prepare, but when I talk with families about what to expect for death, they're, they have no clue. They have nothing but what they've seen on TV, and that's usually more of a traumatic kind of death. Or um, my age group watched Love Story, and that was a really strange, he's, he's my age group. That was really a strange death, because the closer she got to death, the more beautiful she looked, and that's just not really true. Um, but Ellie McGraw. <laughs> Ellie McGraw, yeah. Um, but, but death, 
is really fascinating to me how we can do so much more for people as they start to approach death. And my job, I was a director of hospice, but as a nurse, when I would go out and visit, my job was to control symptoms. And you really can control a lot of the symptoms, the pain, the shortness of breath, the nausea, things like that. We have all kinds of tools to do that so that people can focus on the five tasks that I say are important for dying, for the loved ones as well as the person who's dying. It's to say, I love you, I'm sorry, I forgive you, thank you, and goodbye. And that's really where their heads are at when someone knows that they're terminal and is going to die. They focus more on those things. If I can get the symptoms controlled, they're really interested in that more than anything else. And in hospice, it was based and, and founded on the premise that you can't do this kind of work alone. It is a team approach. And so I supervised nurses and social workers and chaplains and you know, at one point we even had like 200 volunteers in our program, but everybody works together as a team to make sure that we take care of each other because you, you can't do it solo. Even if you're the caregiver at home taking care of someone, you can't do it solo. You, it takes a team to talk it out and to be supportive. And people used to say to me back in the 80s, how can you do this kind of work? Isn't it morbid? Isn't it sad? Isn't it depressing all the time? And as a nurse, I, I think I flipped a switch in my head that said, no longer am I trying to fight to cure someone. I'm trying to give them a good death. I cannot control, I cannot fix. They're going to die. And when you start from that premise and work to making it a good death, um, it's not as depressing or sad. You feel success when you've made a good death, when you've allowed that person to have choice and die they want, the way they wanted to die. The worst thing is for people to not be told and not to know that they're going to die and feel like they were cheated out of some time that they wanted to do something special with. Um, that's real important. And from a faith-based look, I like this quote by Tabor that I've used a lot, and, and it's, I'll just end with that. It's a quote that says, death is not extinguishing the light. It is only putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. ways that I've interacted with death have to do with, um, for 11 years I worked in the jail in Lapeer County, Michigan, where I live, and um, whenever someone committed a murder, I would go in and do a mental status exam, just basically asking them the questions about, you know, do they hear voices, do they have a family history of mental illness. Um, so I interacted with a lot of people in term that had just been brought into the jail in terms of that. Um, that's a different kind of of interaction, for sure. Um, a lot of things, and I, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. That's a lot of darkness, and um, you know how to deal with some of those kinds of things, and how to deal with 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 it for yourself when you're carrying those kinds of things. Um, and then now I'm working on a suicide prevention panel, and I work uh, with the suicide survivors group. So I work with the people who've lost someone to suicide, and in both of those cases, the death is a very traumatic event. And it's very, very different thing for someone to lose somebody who they knew was sick for a long time rather than to lose somebody who shot themselves or hung themselves, especially if that's the person who found them. So um, you're talking about a traumatic memory that they have in their head and how do, they, how do they get past that? Because they have the grief of losing the person and then they have their anger about you know, what the person did to themselves. So um, I think, um, First of all, I think that in that case, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's an honor that they come and share their stories, and I'm really, you know, I think that what we do is a real blessing. I, I'm very, I love what I do, um, but I just think that uh, helping somebody to be able to go through the process of mourning that and to find a way that they can incorporate that trauma into their life. Um, and I think a lot of how a person is able to deal with it has a lot to do with their spiritual beliefs. And I've asked people who have, you know, committed a murder, what do you believe happens to you when you die? And they'll say, well, you just go on the ground and then you rot. And I think if that's what you believe, that's going to be 
a different kind of experience for you than if you believe that, a, that, that your spirit has left and your body is here and your spirit has gone to the other side. So I think that people who have that kind of belief have a lot easier time in dealing with the loss of the person. They miss them, you know, and for themselves, but they still have some kind of belief that they can rely on. And I think the same thing is true for dealing with it. Um, for me, it's like each day, no matter what comes in or who I talk to and what kind of burdens they carry that they share, um, I like to believe that I'm present with them when they're there, but when they leave that I can turn that over as well and say, you know, turn it over, say a prayer for that person um, and just believe that, you know, I've done what I could when I was there. So I think that when you're done and you've been through something that's very traumatic or someone shares that with you, to find a way to, to get that off of you, like you mentioned, people going out and drinking. And that is the way that a lot of people might deal with something that's very traumatic. But hopefully if you have some other kinds of things that you can do, some kind of ritual where you can kind of, uh, you know, leave what you're dealing with there and then um, get back into your own, your own personal life. So um, for me personally, I do believe that, you know, uh, when you die, your spirit goes on, that your body is left behind, but your spirit continues. So I think that brings me some sort of peace with that. So um, my perspectives are um, very different. Uh, working as a scientist within the, the medical legal uh, community, um, I work around death um, pretty much every day. I study uh, human skeletal remains. Um, some of them are ancient, uh, some of them are recent, and I teach uh, courses in you know human uh, osteology to students. And it's really easy to forget that the uh, the remains of the people that you study are are people. And it's one of the things that you have to remind yourself of. Um, my experiences um, have primarily, primarily been working in Northern California for um, Sheriff Coroner's offices. We do assist with um, scene recoveries, uh, so places where people have died or where their bodies were, were dumped in cases of homicides, um, fire scenes, a lot of different types of scenarios. And so um, because of the medical legal framework, you're largely isolated from the grieving families of the cases that you work on. Uh, you, you tend not to have to interact with them or, or, or know about them. And so you're kind of working um, on these remains. You're trying to assist with identification, you know, trying to figure out who the person was, and we use you know, different scientific methods for that. Um, but only a handful of times have I ever had to actually interact with a family member. And sometimes they've been you know, really interesting where uh, we went to search for a missing person and the family came along with us and they they basically made us sandwiches brought us you know water and just wait were, were there with us for the entire day and it was really awkward because i had never experienced that before and the sheriff's office was that they said it was okay and it, it was fine it was just fine but um there were so few opportunities because of the way that the medical legal system is set up that it uh, sort of divorces you from having having to deal with the actual uh, death event or dealing with the, uh, the grieving families um, and all the issues surrounding that. So it's been very few times where I've had to deal with that. Um, it's really easy to um, uh, become a little callous and just sort of view your, your, uh, your case as a number. And I, one thing I have to do is remind myself who this person is and when they're identified, refer to them by their name. So that I, you know, you have to remind yourself that these are these are people, and they had families, they had people that cared about them, and um, you know they're not just they aren't just numbers, um, as uh, Dr. Clapper uh, was just saying. Um, some of the more, I guess, uh, dramatic or traumatic, I don't know what, what word sounds best here, but uh, um, more intensive types of, of, of things I've been involved in. I, I had a chance in uh, 2000 to go to um, Bosnia. And uh, working under the United Nations was able to uh, excavate mass graves related to the uh, Srebrenica massacre. And if you know anything about the, the Balkan Wars that happened between about 1991 and 1995, um, there were several hundred thousand people who died and there were many acts of uh, genocide that were committed. And the Srebrenica massacre actually happened after um, Bill Clinton and Slobodan Milosevic, the president of Serbia at the time, had signed the Dayton Peace Accord, ending the war. While that was going on, about 7,500 men and uh, teenage boys were uh, systematically um, taken to different uh, locations and were executed. So within three days in uh, July of 1995, 
you had uh, you know roughly 7,500 people mass killed, and we're still uh, people are still digging these mass graves uh, related to to that particular um, incident. I had an opportunity to work on some of the mass graves um, relating to those cases, and uh, you know the time that I was invited to go down there, I didn't know anything. I couldn't have found Bosnia on the map. I was in college, just starting grad school, and I uh, really didn't know very much about what had happened there when I went there. It was very eye-opening, um, and it wasn't really the, the work was very difficult because it's you know hard working conditions and mass graves may have had anywhere from 50 to 200 bodies in them, and it's very difficult work to excavate forensically a case of that size or the you know just a, a massive grave and working with a large international team. But it was when you met um, people in, you know, in town square or getting a coffee, talking with local people, and it was hard to find somebody that didn't lose someone in the war. And uh, we would never tell anyone what we did because they would ask us questions because they're missing people too. And so it was this really sort of unique situation where you really um, you know, kept a low profile um, but dealing with the, um, the living was much more harder than dealing with the dead because it reminded you of the horrors and atrocities that occurred um, uh, during that period. And you know, things were pretty, you know, pretty unbelievable. Um, another um, major um, thing that I worked on was the World Trade Center disaster. <coughs> and um, I'd spent two summers in New York City in uh, 2002 and 2003 uh, helping to um, identify about uh, 20,000 human remains, and uh, me and three other anthropologists had to go through all the human remains cases uh, from World Trade Center and had to identify, you know, what part of the body did this body part come from, um, and it was just, you know, intensive working conditions. Um, we worked in um, a large tent that was outside, and they had semi-trucks, uh, refrigerated semi-trucks backed into the tent. Uh, the whole area was secured by the, the NYPD. And you'd have to work in this tent, and it was a, I had a heat wave, and it was 110 degrees, and you're wearing all your personal protective equipment, and you're just sweating like crazy, and then you have to go into a refrigerated truck, and you know, you're just hot and cold all day long, very uncomfortable conditions. And then the area was also a memorial for um, victims, families, and so you'd have to clean up everything uh, when they had a memorial scheduled. You'd have to take all the put all the um, photographs, uh, picture frames, flowers, and put them back on there, clean everything up, um, and then we'd have to you know, go wait in a trailer while family members came and um, you know, had blessings and prayers and things like that. So it was really, um, this was a memorial and a forensic uh, investigation going on at the same place at the same time, and we had to sort of work around those things. It was just really kind of hit home the, the scope and scale of this disaster, and, and you know, we had approximately, uh, I think it was 2,743 victims, um, just what they were going through, you know, and, and only maybe 60 or so percent of the people and the, the remains have been identified. Um, so there's still um, probably about 40 percent or so of the victims who, whose families have, you know, they know what happened, but they, they don't have anything to um, remember these people. They don't have um, any, any human remains uh, that they can claim and have a, a funeral. And so I think for a lot of families, it's been uh, very difficult to have closure and things like that. And uh, again, you have to remind yourself, you know, you're working, these remains are people, people who have families with loved ones and things like that. And um, what um, uh, Dr. Clapper had mentioned about the personal effects sometimes, you know, meaning more than the remains. I mean, I look at bones and tissue and all different states of condition all the time. But when you see something like, um, you know, a purse that was uh, forgotten about was supposed to be collected by the NYPD property, that reminded you, um, oh, this is, this was a person's, this was a woman's purse. Um, I remember dealing with a more complete body uh, from the World Trade Center. And I was, you know, wearing all these you know, gloves and personal protective equipment and it was a fairly complete body, and I opened the body bag, and I hear a click, and I thought, well, that sounded like a seatbelt. 
And it turned out that was a plane victim that was still in the seat from the plane. And so just remembering that that person clicked that belt when they got on the plane, you know, when you do that, and just hearing that sound and then realizing what it was, the, the fabric from the seat had torn off the seat, was still attached to this person. It, that sound just really disturbed me because it was just such a unexpected thing. And so it was just little things like that that make you kind of uh, remind you of the, you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And kind of from my perspective, I, I, uh, I'm able to detach myself from the, the death component and the grieving component with the um, casework that I do. Um, but I always feel like what I'm doing has a good cause because I know I've had family members either usually indirectly through the sheriff's office thank us for the work that we did. And I know that families appreciate, they may not know all the, all the things that we had to go through to help identify someone or, or find out what happened to them. But I know a lot of families really appreciate that they're people who will work long hours for very little money to do this. So I guess that's um, kind of my, been my perspective. So as a cultural and medical anthropologist, I would say that um, I confront death in a few different ways in my work. Um, and it's somewhere in between the kind of um, scientific confrontation that you've just described and um, the, the way you confront death in the service of the process. Um, a couple of ways that I confront death are more analytically grounded. As a medical anthropologist um, uh, who works on issues of public health, I see death as um, a health outcome or a health care outcome. Um, and since my work is grounded in social justice issues, um, a lot of what I do is dedicated towards better understanding uh, barriers to access to health care and then how that impacts uh, specifically women living with HIV, how it impacts their abilities uh, to take care of themselves. Um, a second kind of analytical way that, that I confront death is, is in how I witness uh, women's process of moving through the health care system as they uh, try to generate the tools they need in order to care for themselves. Um, I see women learn how to think about health in relation to their own behaviors. Um, and a lot of times they learn to do this um, through physicians teaching them about HIV-related blood work. So women will learn about how uh, their viral loads can indicate um, how quickly uh, HIV is replicating in their bodies. And their CD4 cell counts can tell them how strong their immune systems are. and. Uh, so they learn to sort of act in accordance with where their blood work is at. So that a woman who perhaps has addiction problems uh, will learn from her physician how the, her drug of choice actually ends up helping to replicate HIV in the body, um, perhaps makes it more likely that she'll miss medication doses, and so then will have um, a decrease in CD4 cell counts. And so I watch women sort of go through this process where they're learning how to think about their HIV disease, how they're learning how to connect their own behaviors with what's happening in their bodies. And I sort of see them confronting death for themselves in ways that they hadn't done before. For a lot of women that I work with, um, they start off uh, first at diagnosis immediately thinking that they're going to die. And for women with addiction problems, uh, this tends to sort of throw them into a binging cycle where they're kind of numbing their fear or their pain um, through drugs. Um, and then uh, over time, women talk about how they learn from others in their community or at support groups um, or from physicians or social workers, whoever they're in touch with about their disease, that they learn over time that they can actually live with this if they just take the medications, engage in healthy behaviors, um, and watch their blood counts as they're supposed to. So what I see oftentimes is women sort of measuring for themselves how near or far they are from death according to what these laboratory numbers are telling them. So that's sort of a second analytical way um, that I confront death in my work. Um, the third way that I would say I confront it is less analytically grounded and is more personal and is definitely definitely more awkward. Um, because my work involves immersing myself into the lives of research participants, I grow really close with a lot of them. 
Um, you know, my work isn't just about uh, interviews and surveys and uh, you know, asking people how their health is. It's actually coming to family parties. It's going to church with them. It's um, you know, talking with them on the phone if they've woken up at night and they're freaking out about something happening in their lives. Um, so I've had um, probably five or six research participants over the last few years um, who have died of HIV-related causes. Um, and frankly, I never know how to handle that. Um, of course, I feel sadness and sorrow, and I mourn the loss. But then there's also this analytical part that I have to attend to, how to talk about this in my work. Is it okay to talk about it in my work? I've never talked with these women about, if you should die, can I talk about the conditions of your death in whatever I write? So it's this really kind of awkward process for me right now. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, one of the research participants that I've grown very close to for my work in North Carolina, um, her, one of her daughters, uh, first she Facebooked me and asked me if I could get a hold of her. So I called her and um, she told me that her mom, uh, who was a research participant in my study, that her mom uh, was dying. She had kidney failure and because she's an addict, there's no way she's going to get a transplant. Um, her liver also was uh, in bad shape. so. They don't know how long she has to live. And what she wanted to know was if I could do anything for her. So I'm thinking, well, well, what do you mean by anything? What does she need? And they didn't even really know. They just knew that they wanted their mom to be comfortable in this process. They didn't know how to make that happen. They didn't know if there were resources out there for her. And she didn't want to go into hospice care. <laughs> So um, the best I could do at that point was to contact social service providers that I knew in the area and set up meetings for um, this woman's daughter to have with them. Um, about three days after I did that, I got a call from the woman herself. And it was really awkward, right? And I'm thinking as we're talking, is this the last time I'm going to talk to you? And do I thank you for everything you've done for me, or do I just... <coughs> kind of push through the conversation, assuming that we're going to talk again. And turns out I didn't have to answer that question because she said outright, this is really weird and I can't do this right now. I said, okay. And so that's where that is. <laughs> so I don't really have, um, some of you have given advice and I think it's fantastic advice. I don't really have any, um, just to say that these are the ways that I confront death in my work and I think like all of you are saying, it, it's hard, uh, but it is also um, in its own way, I think rewarding that you're privileged enough to get to be a part of this process um, in people's lives. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, I heard a couple common themes. One was how much the caretakers need to be taken care of how difficult it is for them, how stressful. Um, but I also heard some different perspectives as to what kind of distance you each have to put between yourselves and death, yourselves and the dying, um, to cope with it. And uh, uh, Dr. Bartolink, you talked about kind of a professional distance. You at least don't have to deal with people who are dying. You, fit, you deal with them after they've passed away, and I, I can relate to that in my professional capacity of teaching gross anatomy. I don't have to deal with dying people, but I do, along with my students, have to work rather intimately with the, with the cadavers. Um, but, yeah, but I was going to ask you your different perspectives on how do you establish that proper distance? Well, <coughs> I will say that it, uh, it's important to have both the distance uh, and the personal connection. Um, and I saw that that first night. I spent the night of the plane crash walking around the perimeter and talking to the firefighters and the security policemen and so forth. And uh, Two of the firefighters who had seen the plane crash shared this story. Um, and I think it, it uh, shows our, one of our human coping mechanisms, and that's humor. Uh, so if you 
find yourself cracking jokes, certainly, you know, you don't want to do that around family members or, or people that are dying, but with fellow workers, sometimes that can be uh, uh, healing. And so <laughs> this incident, uh, when they saw the plane crash, uh, they were both sitting there in a fire truck waiting, waiting to respond, and they saw um, a man fly through the air right afterwards, <coughs> a set of golf clubs flew through the air, right, right behind him. And one turned to the other and said, well, I guess he was just playing through. <laughs> Which, if you know about golf, is a, a term that uh, we use on the golf course. And they laughed, and, and I laughed with them. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, in the right place, in the right context. Uh, uh, so uh, one thing I'd want to want to lift up too is um, uh, Dr. Broadway, uh, Eric, uh, when you mentioned, and some of these things uh, become so vivid in your mind, when you mentioned the refrigerator trucks, the same thing, so you say, it, you know, it's the middle of July, 100 degrees, what are you going to do? They brought in these refrigerator trucks, and I, I have pictures of, you know, 50 body bags with just a number spray painted on them, stacked up in these refrigerator trucks, so sometimes these uh, images just uh, stay with you, so I was reminded of that. We invite others to comment. I was thinking that um, I did a, a training for law enforcement on crisis debriefing, and my training was supposed to be about the importance of crisis debriefing. They didn't have a crisis debriefing program, and um, like CISM, CISM, that kind of thing. They they really they had not nothing really for officers that had had some kind of traumatic event to, to deal with it. It was just kind of a you know bootstrap or suck it up kind of man mentality. And so I met with them just to talk about how important that is for people. And because, you know, police officers, it is kind of, you know, a tough guy thing. And there is a high rate of suicide among police officers, a high rate of alcohol and drug abuse among officers. I mean, how do you cope with these kinds of things? So I was just basically talking about what it was and how it was needed. And so many officers, like, raised their hand and said, Sue, I had to go tell a mother that both of her children were killed in a car accident. So I saw, I had to go where there were babies trapped in a house and I couldn't get in there. And I mean, they carried all this stuff with them and they really had nothing to do with it because there was no, no way for them to really be able to deal with it. And just kind of like you said about like a trauma memory is not the same as any other memory that you have. When you have a trauma, it's burned into your brain in a way that it, you can smell something and it'll remind you. You can see it exactly as if it's happening right now. I mean, it's all through your senses, so it doesn't get integrated properly. And if you never deal with that, that's, that's going to be popping up, and that's something that's a really difficult thing. So when people have, like, these very traumatic kinds of death or they deal with traumatic death, they have to have a way to be able to overcome it. And there is a lot of treatment for trauma. There's, you know, EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization, and internal family systems, which help people deal with trauma. And people need to get some help when they have faced some kind of trauma instead of just an idea that you just should get on with it. Right, yeah. I was getting a massage one day, and this was really not a very relaxing massage. And the massage therapist said to me, um, I found my son hanging, and I was never allowed to talk about it. And so she talked about that for our entire hour. And I mean, you, I'm not going to tell somebody, no, you can't.